Okay, and we start again. <laughs> so today we read chapter one of Meeting the Universe Halfway by Karen Barrett. Let's begin. Because truth we don't suspect have a hard time making themselves felt, as when 13 species of whiptail lizards composed entirely of females stay undiscovered due to bias against such existing, we have to meet the universe halfway. Nothing will unfold for us unless we move towards what looks to us like nothing. Faith is a cascade. The sky high solid is anything but. The sun going under hasn't budged. And if death divests the self, it's the sole event in nature that's exactly what it seems. Alice Fulton, Cascade Experiment. On the morning after giving an invited lecture on the constructed nature of scientific knowledge, I had the privilege of watching as an STM scanning tunneling microscope operator zoomed in on a sample of graphite. And as we approached a scale of thousands of nanometers, hundreds of nanometers, tens of nanometers, down to fractions of a nanometer, Individual carbon atoms were imaged before our very eyes. The experience was so sublime that it sent chills through my body. And I stood there, a theoretical physicist who, like most of my kind, rarely ventures into the basements of physics buildings that experimental colleagues call home, conscious that this was one of those life moments when the amorphous jumble of history seems to crystallize in a single instant. How many times had, I'd re had I recounted for my students the evidence for the existence of atoms? And there they were, just the right size and grouped in a hexagonal structure with the interatomic spacings as predicted by theory. If only Einstein, Rutherford, Bohr, and especially Mach could have seen this, I explained. And as the undergraduate students operating the instruments, which they had just gotten to work the day before by carefully eliminating sources of vibrational interference, we're talking nanometers here, disassembled the chamber that held the sample so that I could see for myself the delicate positioning of the probe above the graphite surface expertly cleave with a piece of scotch tape, I mused aloud that seeing atoms will quickly become routine for students, as examining cells with visual light microscopes, and in turn the structure of molecules by electron microscopes, became routine for earlier generations. And that I was grateful to have been brought up in a scientific era without this particular expectation. At this point in my story, I imagine there will be scientific colleagues who will wonder whether this presented a moment of intellectual embarrassment for your narrator, who had on the previous night insisted on the constructed nature of scientific knowledge. In fact, although I was profoundly moved by the event I had just witnessed, standing there before the altar of the efficacy of the scientific enterprise, I was unrepentant. For as constructivists have tried to make clear, empirical adequacy is not an argument that can be used to silence charges of constructivism. The fact that scientific knowledge is constructed does not imply that science doesn't work. And the fact that science works does not mean that we have discovered human independent facts about nature. Of course, the fact that empirical adequacy is not proof of realism is not the end point, but the starting point for constructivists who must explain how it is that such constructions work, an obligation that seems all the more urgent in the face of increasingly compelling evidence that the social practice of science is conceptually, methodologically, and epistemologically allied along particular axes of power. On the other hand, I stand in sympathy with my scientific colleagues who want science study scholars to remember that there are cultural and natural causes for knowledge claims. 
While most constructivists go out of their way to attempt to dispel the fears that they are neither either denying the existence of a human independent world or the importance of natural, material, or non-human factors in the construction of scientific knowledge, the bulk of the attention has been on social or human factors. To be fair, this is where the burden of proof has been placed. Constructivists have been responding to the challenge to demonstrate the falsity of the worldview that takes science as the mirror of nature. Nonetheless, as both the range and sophistication of constructivist argument have grown, the charge that they embrace an ex equally extreme position that science mirrors culture has been levied against them with increasing vigor. While few constructivists actually take such an extreme position, science study scholars would be remiss in simply dismissing this charge as trivial oversimplification and misunderstanding of the varied and complex positions that come under the rubric of constructivism. The anxiety being expressed, though admittedly displaced, touches on the legitimate concern about the privileging of epistemological issues over ontological ones in the constructivist literature. Ontological issues have not been totally ignored, but they have not been given sufficient attention. The ontology of the world is a matter of discovery for the traditional realist. The assumed one-to-one -one correspondence between scientific theories and reality is used to bolster the further assumption that scientific entities are unmarked by the discoverers. Nature is taken to be revealed by, yet independent of, theoretical and experimental practices, that is, transparently given. Acknowledging the importance of Cartwright's 1983 philosophical analysis decoupling these assumptions and her subsequent separation of scientific realism into two independent positions, realism about theories and realism about entities. Hacking in 1982, like Cartwright, advocates realism towards entities. Shifting the focus and studies of science away from the traditional emphasis on theory construction to the examination of experimental practice Hacking grounds his position on the ability of the experimenter to manipulate entities in the laboratory. That which exists it is that which we can use to intervene in the world to affect something else. Electrons are counted as real because they are effective experimental tools, not because they have been found. Gallison in 1987 also centers experimental practice in his historical analysis comparing three different periods of 20th century physics experimentation, wherein he generalizes Hacking's criterion for the reality of entities by underlining the importance of the notions of stability and directedness. Other approaches go further in interrogating the immediate dareness of nature. Latour in 1993 prioritizes stability as well, posing it as one variable of a two-dimensional geometry whose other axis connects the poles of nature and society. Essence thus becomes the trajectory of stabilization within this geometry that is meant to characterize the variable ontologies of quasi-objects. In contrast, Haraway in 1988 emphasizes instability. It is the instability of boundaries defining objects that is the focal point of her explicit challenge not only to conceptions of nature that claim to be outside of culture, but also to the separation of epistemology from ontology. The instability of boundaries and Haraway's insistence that the objects of knowledge are agents in the production of knowledge feature her notions of cyborgs in 1985 and material semiotic actors in 1988, which strike up dissonant and harmonic resonances with Latour's hybrids, and quasi-objects. Moving to what some consider the opposite pole of the traditional realist position are the semiotic and deconstructionist positions. To many scientists, as well as science study scholars, the theories of semiotics and deconstruction which call into question the assumed congruity of signifier and signified, insisting on the intrinsic arbitrariness of the sign or representation seem to be the ultimate in linguistic narcissism. 
However, while insisting that we are always ready in the theater of representation, Hales, in 1993, takes exception to extreme views that hold that language is groundless play. And while she does not provide us with access to the real, she does attempt to place language in touch with reality by reconceptualizing referentiality. Hale's theory of constrained constructivism relies on consistency in opposition to the realist notion of congruence and the semiotic notion of negativity to acknowledge the importance of constraints offered by a reality that cannot be seen in its positivity. As she puts it, although there may be no outside that we can know, there is a boundary. These attempts to say something about the ontology of our word are exceptions rather than the rule in the science studies literature. What is needed is a deeper understanding of the ontological dimensions of scientific practice. It is crucial that we understand the technologies by which nature and culture interact. Does nature provide some template that gets filled in by culture in ways that are compatible with local discourses? Or do specific discourses provide the lens through which we view the layering of culture on nature? Does the full texture of nature get through? Or is it partially obliterated or distorted in the process? Is reality an amorphous blob that is structured by human discourses and interactions? Or does it have some complicated, irregular shape that is differently sampled by varying frameworks that happen to fit in local regions, like coincident segments of interlocking puzzle pieces? Or is the geometry fractal, so that it is impossible for theories to match reality, even locally? Well, can any such question be answered, if at all? And what would it mean? Is it possible to take any of these questions seriously in the academy of the early 21st century? Won't this sound too much like metaphysics to those of us trained during the various states of decay of positivist culture. And if we don't ask the various, uh, sorry, if we don't ask these questions, what will be the consequences? As Donna Haraway reminds us, what counts as an object is precisely what world history turns out to be about. I seek some way of trying to understand the nature of nature and the interplay of the material and the discursive, the natural and the cultural, in scientific and other social practices. Consequently, I will place considerably more emphasis on ontological issues than, in commons, in common, in, than is common in science studies, although I will not ignore the epistemological issues either, since there is good reason to question the traditional Western philosophical belief that ontology and epistemology are distinct concerns. After articulating a new onto-epistemological framework, I will own up to its realist tenor. After a resurgence of interest in scientific realism in the 1980s, its popularity seems to have waned once again, if not because of the death knell sounded by Fine's 1984 clever accounting of the metatheoretical failure of arguments for realism, then at least because of the commonplace tendency on the part of constructivists to present scientific realism as naive, unreflexive, and politically invested in its pretense to an apolitical posture. In fact, the pairing of constructivism with some form of anti-realism has become nearly axiomatic. If we acknowledge the cultural specificity of scientific knowledge construction, are we not obligated to relinquish the hope of constructing theories that are true representations of independent reality? For example, in offering a concrete case of the underdetermination thesis, Cushing in 1994 argues that the fact that distinctive theories can account for the same empirical evidence means that realists are hard pressed to make an argument for theoretical access to the actual ontology of the world. For the most part, Constructivists have expressed either outright disdain for, or at least suspicion towards, realism, and have explicitly adopted anti-realist positions, or they have refused the realism-anti-realism debate altogether, either because they feel limited by this very opposition, 
or because they have thought it more fruitful to focus on other issues. I must confess to having sympathy particularly with the latter positions, but I also think that realism has all too quickly been dismissed. Realism has been invoked to support both oppressive and liberatory positions and projects. And my hope is that at this historical juncture, the weight of realism, the serious business and related responsibility involved in truth hunting can offer a possible ballast against the persistent positivist scientific and postmodernist culture that too easily confuse theory with play. Realizing the multiplicity of meanings and that realism connotes at that juncture, I want to clarify that I take realism in the first instance. As a starting point, I follow Cushing's lead. I assume, perhaps unreasonably, that scientific realist believes successful scientific theory to be capable of providing reliable and understandable access to the ontology of the world. If one weakens this demand too much, not much remains except a belief in the existence of an objective reality to which we have little access and whose representation by our theories is nebulous beyond meaningful comprehension. In such a situation, is it worth worrying about whether or not one is a realist? Although I will ultimately add substantive qualification to this definition, I do not intend to weaken what I take to be the spirit of Cushing's demand, and I have therefore selected this starting point to clarify the sense of realism with which I mean to engage, as separate from some other more general uses in the science studies literature, including discussions that oppose realism to relativism, or realism to linguistic monism, or realism to subjectivism. My first concern is not with realism in these senses. I grant that there are forms of anti-realism that are not relativist, that do not deny the existence of an extra-linguistic reality, and that are compatible with various notions of objectivity. That is, in the spirit of Cushing's query, I want to limit the elasticity of the meaning of realism for my initial purposes. Science studies scholars have labored long and hard to articulate moderate constructivist positions that reject the extremes of objectivist, subjectivist, absolutist, and relativist stances, but it is perhaps inappropriate to label these as realist on just such bases alone. That is, I do not want to turn these accomplishments aside by setting up realism as the foil to the entire family of apparitions including some that scientists find most haunting. In this regard, it is perhaps important to acknowledge that feminist science studies scholars in particular staunchly oppose epistemological relativism with an intensity shared by scientists, a fact that may come as a surprise to scientists and others who have not studied the feminist literature, though few have embraced realist positions. Seeing epistemological relativism as the mirror twin of objectivism and both as attempts to deny the embodiment of knowledge claims, feminist theories of science, including Haraway's theory of situated knowledges, Harding's strong objectivity, Keller's dynamic objectivity, and Longino's contextual empiricism, articulate non-relativist and realist positions. Consequently, Although my discussion of realism is concerned with the sense in which direct engagement with the ontology of our world is possible, I will also attempt to satisfy the high standards that have already been set by specifying the ways in which the new form of realism that I propose rejects these other extreme oppositions. I call my proposed onto-epistemological framework agential realism. My motivation for using an adjectival form of agency as the modifier will be clarified later. Importantly, agential realism rejects the notion of correspondence relation between words and things and offers instead a causal explanation of how discursive practices and related to are related to material phenomena. It does so by shifting the focus from the nature of representations, scientific and other, to the nature of discursive practices including techno-scientific ones, leaving in its wake the entire irrelevant debate between traditional forms of realism and social constructivism. 
Crucial to this theoretical framework is a strong commitment to accounting for the material nature of practices and how they come into matter. Thank you.